Sparks and Mayhem, where I tell you a true crime story and we drink. The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you choose to enjoy one of our themed margaritas, please ensure that you are of legal drinking age and have fun but drink responsibly. love story, a crime of passion, a hurricane, a little bit of voodoo, and a whole lot more. This is our most recent crime yet, and yet again, it's a doozy. For today's drink and today's crime, we head to New Orleans, the birthplace of jazz, the Big Easy, the city that care forgot. It is hard to know where to begin to describe the culture of New Orleans. It's one of the most diverse and unusual in the United States. In fact, New Orleans is almost a character in the story. More on that as we go. Today's drink combines two of my favorite drinks, actually. I've visited New Orleans on a few occasions, and I love that you can just buy a drink and walk around outside. A to-go hurricane is actually one of my favorite drinks from the French Quarter, and I'm excited to share this mix with you today. It's actually based on a drink from a pretty famous chain restaurant, um, but I did experiment with it and play around and make it to my liking. So this drink starts with two parts tequila and it wouldn't be a hurricane without rum. Now, normally I don't advertise any alcohol because I'm not sponsored, but I did want to mention this Cypress Creek Reserve single barrel aged rum. This summer I actually went on a very COVID safe getaway, also not sponsored. And we stumbled upon this tiny distillery out in just the middle of nowhere, Wimberley, Texas. So if you're ever out there, it was wonderful and very COVID safe. So we have two parts tequila and we add to that one part rum. So we have our spirits. To our spirits, we're going to add two parts pineapple and two parts orange. Mine is already mixed. That's for the hurricane side. And one part lime juice for the tequila side. You can decide if you want two parts grenadine or three parts grenadine. Tonight, I'm doing three. Fun fact, grenadine is actually pomegranate juice you didn't know that. And then we shake it up. Then, as always, bougie people strain. Tonight we have some new fancy margarita glasses and we're using a red lime salt rim. <laughs> and for a little bit of fun, adding a cherry or two because unfortunately that is the last fun that we're having for today. I wanted to make a quick note about today's episode. In terms of the crimes we've covered so far, this one is a downright current event. I mean, stay tuned for an actual current event that we'll cover in February, but 15 years is really not that long. The deeper I searched for information for today's victim, Addie, the more I came to understand that her friends and family just really don't want her story to be known. She's been reduced in articles and documentaries to basically her mental illness and her gruesome death. I'm tremendously, tremendously bothered by this fact. But the more I've thought about it, the more I've thought it's probably on purpose. This crime didn't happen a hundred years ago, after all. If her family wanted to be interviewed, they would have been interviewed. The things we do know about Addie are the things that were widely known in her circle of friends about her adult life in New Orleans. Her family has chosen to keep the greater story of Addie private, and so I'll choose to do the same. I will talk about her relationship because I think it will help us to understand Zach's motivations, and I will talk about her death because I'm pretty sure that's why y'all are here anyway. But as I was researching for this case, I quit digging into her life, and I hope you'll understand why. 
Y'all, the rabbit holes I went down in this case, from voodoo to the United States military to PTSD to New Orleans itself and so on and so on and so on, oh my goodness. Don't even get me started on Hurricane Katrina. It's been a wild ride. This is also the kind of case that I feel like sticks to your bones. In fact, I'm pretty delayed in recording this just because it's been kind of a challenge for me. Also, fair warning, this is a long one, so make it a double and buckle up, buttercups, because here we go. New Orleans is the kind of place where you can come exactly as you are and the city just takes you in. It's the kind of place where you can be your true self with all your bruises and battered parts out for the world to see, and it seems as if the city itself wraps around you. It's the kind of place where people sort of arrive and never leave. Porch sitting can be a career, and I mean that in the most reverent way possible. The humidity is thick, and the music is beautiful and born of heartbreak. Time itself seems to slow down in New Orleans. And New Orleans is a city that is fascinated with and celebrates death. From crumbling tombs, above ground and encased entirely in cement, to massive funeral parades, often accompanied by brass bands, to ghost tour upon ghost tour upon ghost tour, explaining and sometimes exploiting the haunted realm of New Orleans. It seems New Orleans and macabre are almost synonyms. On Tuesday, October 17, 2006, a 28-year-old combat veteran drank himself into a near stupor, climbed to the seventh floor of the Royal Omni Orleans Hotel, and paced nervously back and forth for some time before launching himself onto the roof of the parking garage below. In his back pocket was a Ziploc bag, which contained his army dog tags, gate keys for a French Quarter apartment, and an envelope labeled police only. When police opened the envelope, they read the words of a tortured soul. This is not accidental. I had to take my own life to pay for the one I took. If you send a patrol car to 826 North Rampart, you will find the dismembered corpse of my girlfriend Addie in the oven, on the stove, and in the fridge, and a full signed confession from myself. Zach Bowen. The tragic story of Addie Hall and Zach Bowen begins for us in Bakersfield, California, where Zach was born in 1978. His parents were separated for much of his youth, and it appears that Zach grew up a fairly typical American kid. He was quite tall. In fact, he was six foot ten by the time he reached high school. Zach had his first major mental health crisis when he was a senior in high school, and he lost his bid for Homecoming King was so bad, in fact, that he begged his mother to be able to start over and move in with his dad in New Orleans to finish his high school career. He got a job when he was 18 years old as a bartender in the French Quarter. I didn't even know you could do that, and apparently neither did his first wife, Lana. 28-year-old Lana met Zach when he was bartending on Bourbon Street, and she had no idea how young he was. Lana found out she was pregnant shortly after she and Zach started dating, and despite her concerns about raising a child with someone who was 10 years her junior and a teenager, once their son was born, Zach really embraced fatherhood. Zach, by all accounts, was an attentive and loving father. Fatherhood really kicked Zach's butt into gear, so to speak, so Zach enlisted in the military in order to support his young family. Soon after, their daughter was born. Zach served tours of duty in Kosovo and Iraq, and he saw combat in both places. There were four major incidents during his time in the military that impacted both his physical and his mental health, and it appears that he suffered from post-traumatic stress syndrome for the rest of his life. The first thing admittedly seems like a small thing, but because he was so tall, he had very large feet, and the military had a hard time finding boots that would fit properly onto his feet, so he developed a very severe case of hammer toe. It had to be surgically corrected, and it was never fully corrected, and so he remained in physical pain in his foot for the rest of his life. A fellow soldier's death in combat affected him significantly. Finally, there were two incidents with deaths of a Kosovar child and an Iraqi child 
that according to his fellow soldiers, messed him over. His tremendous guilt over his possible role in their deaths was something that he just never got over. It was something from which he couldn't recover. It is said that Zach began to fail his physical examinations on purpose in order to be discharged from the military. His relationship with Lana wasn't going well, and the deaths and his injury left him disenchanted and unhappy with the military. Despite his commander's wishes and having received a NATO medal and a presidential unit citation, Zach was given a discharge known as a general under honorable conditions discharge. Most people just call it a general discharge. A general discharge is for soldiers whose performance was satisfactory, but there was some situation that led them to not being able to earn an honorable discharge. While recipients of a general discharge are qualified for VA medical benefits and can be buried in a military cemetery, they aren't eligible for education benefits, and there is typically a big stigma associated with this discharge, and that can make it difficult for a veteran to find jobs or apply for school. When Zach returned to his family in New Orleans, things were on the outs with Lana. She was very frustrated with him for quitting the military as it had provided a very good life for their family. They ended up separating, and in an effort to be able to afford child support, Zach actually took two jobs, one delivering groceries and another as a bartender in the French Quarter again. Because of his charm and fairly good looks and his ability to make good drinks, he was given the best shift at that bar. Zach was young and single and ready to mingle. He could have had any girl he set his eyes on, but he set his eyes on Addie Hall, another bartender at the bar. And he would often stay on after his shift to just chat with her and sit at the bar with her. Slowly, he won her over, or at least her friendship. The year was 2005. Nancy Gibbs writes in Time Magazine, as Katrina, wicked and flirtatious, lingered in the gulf with her eye on the town, many citizens decided they would stay, stubborn or stoic or too poor to have much choice. Zach had originally planned to evacuate New Orleans with Lana and his two children, but before he left, he wanted to stop by and say goodbye to Addie and drop off some supplies. When he saw her at her apartment all alone, he couldn't leave her. As Katrina raged in the Gulf, Lana called Zach, begging him to evacuate with her and the kids. She even suggested that he bring Addie along too. She just wanted him to be safe. But Zach was swept up in Addie's stubbornness, and so he refused. The apocalyptic Category 5 hurricane slammed New Orleans directly, killing 2,000 people and leaving catastrophic flooding in its wake. Miraculously, most of the French Quarter remained completely unharmed. In the weeks that followed Katrina's landfall, Zach and Addie made collective dinners over campfires. They raided local bars and made drinks for friends and lived a very simple, simple life based almost purely on survival. They stayed up all hours of the night with the friends they had made who'd also stayed behind, singing songs and telling stories upon stories. They were swept up in the romance of this strange, chaotic time, and their relationship blossomed. They had nothing to do but survive and have fun. In fact, the New York Times came and did a profile on them. It was quoted in the article that they were intent on keeping alive the distinct and wild spirit of the city. Weeks later, the city began the lengthy process of cleaning up. Zach and Addie began to actually mourn the time they had before. In the chaos of the hurricane, they felt on top of the world. Zach's PTSD reared its ugly head when military forces and tanks rolled in to aid from the cleanup. He was inconsolable, and he self-medicated with drugs and alcohol. It became clear from this point forward that this was a relationship destined for destruction. For the next year, Zach and Addie fought constantly. The toxicity in their relationship exploded. It's pretty obvious from friends and family that they were abusive to each other. They were on again, off again, and fueling their rages with each other with alcohol and cocaine. 
At one point, they loaned their cocaine dealer $900 so that he wouldn't be evicted. And so from that point forward, they were pretty much constantly supplied with the drug whenever they wanted it. This continued for a year. In October of 2006, they moved together into an apartment on North Rampart Street, above a voodoo spiritual temple. Their landlord, Leah Watermeyer, was pretty much just grateful that they had first and last month's rent, which was a rarity in post-Katrina New Orleans. But on October 4th, Addie stormed into Leo's office, demanding that he remove Zach from the lease because Zach had cheated on her with a man that he had met in a gay club a few weeks prior. Mere minutes later, a furious Zach came into the office. He claimed that Addie, who by then had signed the lease by herself, was kicking him out. She was never seen alive again. We know exactly what happened to Addie, because before Zach committed suicide, he journaled extensively about what he did. Ironically, he used the leftover pages from a journal of Addie's. When police, directed by the note in his back pocket, arrived at the apartment 12 days after the murder, The air conditioning was set to 60 degrees, freezing cold. The walls were spray painted all over with messages of regret and pain. One message on the wall directed them to the stove. There, in a pot on one of the burners, was part of Addie. Other parts of her were found in the oven and still others in the fridge. According to the journal, it took four days for Zach to figure out what to do with Addie's remains. During that time, he went on to live life as normal. In fact, his confession letter stated that he wanted to enjoy his last days to the fullest, including good food, good drugs, and good strippers. It appears, both in the suicide letter and according to further investigations, that the dismemberment and cooking of Addie's remains was simply to make the body easier to dispose of. Zach also spent those 12 days spiraling in regret. He burnt himself 28 times with a cigarette, saying it was for his 28 years of being a failure. He wrote, I scared myself not only by the action of calmly strangling the woman I've loved for one and a half years, but by my entire lack of remorse. I've known forever how horrible a person I am, Ask anyone. He spray-painted tons of messages on the wall, such as, I'm a failure. There were also instructions to call Lana to tell her that he loved her. And then, on the top of that roof, he ended his pain forever. But he left his friends and family, and the friends and family of Addie, in pain for the rest of their lives. There are those from the French Quarter and from elsewhere that believe that this is more than a tumultuous love story and murder fueled by chaos, drugs, and mental illness. Some believe that a demonic presence emanating from the voodoo shop below Zach and Addie's apartment influenced Zach. I want to get one thing out of the way right away. The fact that this murder took place above a voodoo temple means actually really nothing whatsoever. I suppose I should say, in my opinion, but even if you've done the most basic research, you will realize that an interpretation of voodoo that's like this is straight out of Hollywood. The Voodoo Spiritual Temple was formed in 1990 under priest Oswan Chamani and Miriam Chamani. It was located in the French Quarter near Congo Square. And it still is, as far as I know, the only voodoo spiritual temple in New Orleans that's based on West African practices and beliefs. Voodoo is a religion that originates in Africa. In the Americas and the Caribbean, it is thought to be sort of a mixture of Native American, Catholic, and African tradition. The religion's fundamental principle is that everything is a spirit. Humans are spirits that populate the seen world and there are other spirits that populate the unseen world. Voodoo is a community-centered religion and supports individual experience, empowerment, and responsibility. The voodoo we see in movies is only lightly based in the religion itself and frankly has its own agenda, perpetuating racism. Voodoo is often coded as a religion of black people. Voodoo is often presented in scenarios that are belittling, dehumanizing, or downright meant to scare the viewer. 
when Hollywood does this, it is a not subtle way of presenting these sentiments about black people to the larger American culture. So would you get rid of your voodoo doll? You're not even using it right anyway. Zach is responsible for what happened that night and what happened in the days that followed. Do I think his post-traumatic stress disorder played a major factor in what happened? Yes. It also appears that he wasn't receiving any sort of treatment for this, despite the ability to receive treatment for this through his general discharge. You want to know what else I think? I think Zach and Addie's relationship was born in chaos, thrived in chaos, and when chaos didn't exist, they created their own chaos. I'm no psychiatrist, but if I had to guess, I think Zach also suffered from a cluster B personality disorder in addition to his post-traumatic stress disorder. This video is already a bit long, so I highly recommend you do your own research on cluster B personality disorders. I will say that a study in the American Journal of Psychiatry published in 2005 stated that people who suffered from PTSD and a cluster B personality disorder were more likely to have suicidal tendencies. And what is the defining characteristic of a cluster B personality disorder? Thriving in chaos. Zach wasn't affected by a demon from the voodoo temple. In the end, Zach was defeated by his own demon. In February of 2016, the voodoo spiritual temple had an electrical fire and was forced to move. In the years since, the Bloody Mary haunted tour and museum managed to snag the entire building and now leads ghost tours that include the apartment. They'll even show you the fridge. If you ask me, this is beyond exploitative, especially considering that this crime is so recent that friends of the pair still live in the neighborhood. I personally could never and would never support that. And I love a ghost tour. I mean, his children are in their early 20s, for goodness sakes. In what can be seen as only the worst case of irony, a friend of the pair, Margaret Sanchez, who was interviewed in multiple documentaries and videos about her best friend, Addie, ended up being arrested herself for the murder and dismemberment of a dancer from Bourbon Street. Suffice it to say, it seems like she got the idea from the murder of her own friend. Addie Hall was buried in Timberlake, North Carolina. Her gravestone is engraved simply with the word poet. So what do you think? Does the military carry at least some burden for these deaths? For not treating one of their own soldiers from a very logical and very obvious case of PTSD? Why do you think Zach didn't seek treatment even though he qualified for it? How does a relationship that starts so sweetly and, and simply turn into something this horrendous? Why do you think he did what he did to the body? Did Margaret get the idea to dismember that body from the deaths of her own friends? Is it okay to cover cases that are this recent in history? What's okay to share and what's just too much? Thanks for hanging out with me. If you have an idea for a case, or better yet, a margarita, feel free to drop it in the comment section below, or better yet, come hang out with us on Instagram. The link is in the description box. I hope you're ready for next week's case, and remember, there's always an alternative to murder.